Well, hello and welcome to In The Growth Space. So great to have you here with us today. This is the opening episode for season three. We have some really amazing guests this season, and I'm really excited to get things started. You know, if you are watching on YouTube, you probably noticed the change in our In The Growth Space studio, aka my office here at Impact Leadership Consulting. So I recorded our, um, our guest today prior to my sabbatical and prior to remodeling the entire office. And so you'll notice a color change. You'll notice uh, you know, bookshelf change, a little bit different change in the setup. Now, if you're not uh, watching on YouTube, if you're only listening to the audio, I just wanna invite you to go to our YouTube channel. Um, the podcast team uh, over the summer and while I was taking my sabbatical, revamped the the channel. Um, so we've got some some shorts, some clips there uh, that you can capture. Um, and, and just it's it's a whole new uh, uh, channel approach to how we're going to deliver the podcast this season. So I want to invite you to go to the YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe there. Make sure you um, give a, a thumbs up and uh, make sure that you hit the little bell that um, uh, announces when we uh, put a new podcast episode up so that you can get notified by uh, YouTube when, when those new episodes come up. So this season, one of the things that we want to be able to do differently than last season is we're going to create some themes. So throughout this season, we're creating themes that will um, be able to supplement or an overarching idea for each of the episodes. And so this, this month's theme, September, is a theme of listening generously and speaking straight, two of our fundamentals that really go hand in hand with, um, with, cultural, with cultural behaviors that I think are really important and fundamental to the success of, of any organization. So, so listening generously and speaking straight are our themes uh, are, are, is our theme for this, this month. Before I get into today's episode and, and our guest today, I want to make sure that I just invite you to go out and rate and review the podcast. If you're on your podcast app, just take a moment right now, scroll to wherever you uh, can give the rating. And if you would just give us a five-star rating, we'd really appreciate it. You know, we're on a mission to reach more leaders and we really have a passion for helping those leaders grow and really the human element of, of growth, um, helping them to grow their own leaders. And so it's going to help us on that mission. If you, if you rate us, you review us, and then if you share it as well. So as I said, today's episode is um, under the theme of listening generously and speaking straight in specifically, it's about listening generously. So our guest today literally wrote the book on how to listen. If you're watching on YouTube, you know, and you can see that I actually have the book, how to listen by Oscar Trimboli. Now, if you listen carefully, you'll also recognize that Oscar is not from the United States. Um, he is actually from Australia, and we have an amazing conversation. Let me tell you just a little bit, though, first about Oscar and give you a little bit of his background. So Oscar Tromboli is on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners. He's an author. He's the host of the Apple award-winning podcast, Deep Listening, and he's a sought-after keynote speaker. He's passionate about using the gift of listening to bring positive change in homes, workplaces, and cultures worldwide. I'm sure you're getting the theme of why I wanted to have him on the podcast. He's interviewed over 100 of the most diverse workplace listeners including air traffic controllers, deaf and foreign language interpreters, hostage negotiators, and spies as part of researching world-class listeners. Over 14,000 people have contributed to his research about what gets in their way when it comes to listening. 
Oscar is a marketing and technology industry veteran. He worked for uh, Microsoft, PeopleSoft, Polycom, and Vodafone. He consults with uh, American Express, AstraZeneca, Google, HSBC, Montblanc, PwC, Salesforce, Setify, and Siemens. A lot of great names there. Um, Oscar loves his afternoon walks with his wife, Je Jenny, and their dog, Kilimanjaro. I love that name. Um, and he, he will always be playing Lego with one of his four grandchildren on the weekends as well. So I am so proud to have this conversation with Oscar. And let me just say too, if you, if you listen to the end, there's some bonus material that I've asked the podcast team to leave in because as we were getting ready to close up, Oscar asked me to um, just leave it roll for just a few minutes. And he asked me some questions that I think will be really instructive for you. And there's also a bonus for the first five people who not only listen to the end, but do what I ask at the end. So if you ask at the end, I've got a special treat for you and uh, a gift that we want to put into your hands as well. So here is the episode one of season three with Oscar Trimboli now. Welcome, Oscar. I am so glad to have you on the podcast. Really grateful to have, here, have you here. Uh, welcome. Thanks, David. Really looking forward to listening to your questions today. <laughs> uh, and, and for our listeners, um, I am just excited about this conversation because if you've listened uh, to the podcast for any length of time, you've likely heard me talk about generous listening, listening generously as a fundamental to our culture and the way we, we work within our organization. Well, Oscar is a, uh, I'm going to call you a guru of listening. You may not like that terminology, but I think uh, <laughs> that's, that's where, that's what I think. But uh, so you have written a book on, on listening. You've written a book on how to listening and, and how to go uh, listen at a, at a deep level. I'm curious to start the conversation off, Oscar, what got you into that? What, what led you to this whole area of, of deep listening and, and listening in general? Well, to understand that, you have to go into a boardroom meeting in April of 2008. I'm in a budget setting meeting, a video conference between 18 people, Sydney, Seattle, Singapore, and uh, can imagine a lot of people in uh, very formal positions, negotiating budgets and some people behind them, supporting them with laptops and business analysts and spreadsheets and data analysis and all kinds of things happening in the background. This meeting was due to go for 90 minutes. And uh, at the 20 minute mark, my vice president in the room said to me, Oscar, we need to talk immediately after this meeting. It's the equivalent of honey, we need to talk. <laughs> it's the conversation you don't really look forward to. Now, miraculously, this meeting finished early. It finished at the 17-minute mark. And as everybody kind of made their way out of the room, Tracy, she said to me, Oscar, please make sure the door is closed when everybody leaves. And as I walked back towards her, the only thing going through my head was, hmm, I'm going to get fired. She says, as I'm walking back to sit down, Next to her, you don't even know what you did at the 20-minute mark, do you? And I thought, great, I'm getting fired, and I don't even know why. Now, dirty little secret, David, at the 20-minute mark, after Tracy said, we need to talk immediately after this meeting, I stopped listening to whatever was going on in the budget meeting. The only thing I was doing was figuring out how many weeks of salary I had left in my bank account <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be long for this role. I sat down and Tracy said to me, if you could code how you listen, you could change the world. And as profound, as thoughtful, as care-filled, and as generous as that listening was, the only thing going through my head was, woohoo, I haven't been <laughs> fired. <laughs> and then two, two weeks later, my, my um, chief financial officer, Brian, asked me to come and audit his listening in, a, in another budget setting meeting. And as I started to write down what I noticed in his listening, I realized I was starting to code how to listen. And, you know, here we are in 
2023 and we've written three books. We've got uh, a, a listening tool that over 27,000 people have taken mm-hmm. and uh, we've got jigsaw puzzle games. We've got practice cards. We've got all kinds of ways to help people improve how they listen day to day. So that's mm-hmm. how it all started. Man, that's amazing. Uh, I, I love hearing those, those, you know, origin stories, because I think then it helps to inform us on, you know, your journey um, so far. You know, one of the things, Oscar, that I, I hear all the time from leaders is how do, how do I listen? And how do I get better at listening, especially when the pace of life is so fast? And we have to be going at such a pace that it makes it really difficult. Well, I think the first thing is to notice the assumption that we have to go at this pace. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure who made up that rule, who got into a room and said, we need to have back-to-back meetings and we need to cram as much <laughs> in to our day as humanly possible and schedule our meetings within a razor blade thickness of a slither of time only to turn up to that meeting completely distracted because we haven't processed the last meeting or we arrive on time physically yet mentally we are not available to that conversation till 5, 10, 15 minutes into the discussion. I think, you know, in our, our first book, that I wrote, which was called Breakthroughs, How to Challenge Your Assumptions, we want to notice the edge of our mental models. Mm. As leaders, just do what David's done. Make sure you get the backstory into any conversation you go into. Once you understand where people are coming from, you can generously listen and navigate together a common future that takes into account multiple perspectives and a shared outcome. So really practically, if you're a leader, don't start a meeting at the top of the hour or at the bottom of the hour. You are in control of your schedule. Time as a synchronized concept did not exist until the 1800s when the British railway system tried to synchronize time. Uh, Up until then, Time in your village was the sound of a church bell or the call of an imam to the mosque Mm -hmm. for prayer. Time Mm -hmm. didn't matter. And honestly, time is a fiction. Once you know you have much more control over that than you think, you might be surprised. So if you are scheduling a meeting as a leader, as an emerging leader, don't schedule it at the top of the hour. Here's what will happen if you schedule the meeting at five after the hour. Wow, Oscar, I really look forward to coming to your meetings. I have time to visit the bathroom, drink a glass of water, have something to eat. And I arrive prepared, available, and able to generously listen to whatever the conversation is. Or start the meeting at the top of the hour. This is what happens. Oh, look, Oscar, sorry, I'm late. I've just come from another meeting and I'm really sorry. And you arrive at at two minutes past. And while you're apologizing, we get to three minutes past, four minutes past, and five minutes past. Although you're physically and mentally in the meeting, you have arrived with the equivalent of an airbag going off in a car Mm. and the seatbelt retracting you into position. You're not actually ready. You've been shocked into being ready, yet you can schedule the meeting at five after the hour. You'll create a completely different container for the conversation. And finish a meeting in 50 minutes. Nobody said one hour meeting was uh, (laughs) scientifically proven as the most productive way to progress an outcome. So just Mm. experiment with that. You'll, You'll get five minutes back at the beginning and end of the meeting. You can't control the meetings you're invited to, but you can control the meetings that you set up and you're creating a space to listen. Mm. Boy, I love, 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 love that. Um, You know, I, it's, it's so interesting that you bring up the idea of time and the fact that, you know, we, who says that we have to go through life going at, you know, Mach three with our hair on fire. And, um, I, I, I think that 
one of the things that that does from my perspective is that it puts an, a, a sense of intentionality back into the leader's hands and it creates the ability for them to lead in a way that is probably, well, it is counterculture. And I'm sure in a lot of organizations, it's countercultural to the, to the whole organization. Um, how do they, so if we're not in charge of setting those times, what's the best way to be able to show up and be ready to listen then? I, I'm just kind of curious um, in, in that regard. Well, I'll, I'll give you three tips and maybe a bonus. Uh, okay. Number one, electronic notifications of any kind uh, are the number one barrier to your listening. And this sneaky thing called the connected watch in our research is, is the emerging thing that is distracting people the most in a meeting. They may turn up with no devices whatsoever, but everybody can see you trying to triage your email or your WhatsApp <laughs> or your text message via your phone. Don't worry, your sneaky little side look. <laughs> Nobody's confusing you with some kind of spy. We know what you're doing. Yeah. So please, uh, uh, whether you're on Android or iPhone, whether you're on Mac or PC, there's one button in all those operating systems that says, if I have a meeting schedule, just switch off my notifications. Mm -hmm. yeah, you only cool. have to do that once and it will help your brain to relax a bit. Tip number two, drink a glass of water before you go into a conversation. Mm. All these tips will be very easy to say, very difficult to practice. Yet if you practice them, our deep listening ambassador community say they get between one and four hours a week back in their schedule. Mm. The tip number two, drink a glass of water before you go into a conversation. This sends a signal just around the chest, around the lungs to the nervous system around here that protects us as humans and says, hey, relax, everything's okay. Mm. Your, your breathing will slow down. Your heart rate will slow down. Your mind will be prepared for the conversation. If your meeting goes for more than half an hour, drink a glass of water at least every half an hour. That doesn't mean gulp a glass of water at 30 minutes past the hour. It just means sip as you go along and, you know, try and get a glass of water down by each half an hour of the meeting. Uh, tip number three, just notice your breathing. Mm, yeah. Three deep breaths in through the nose, all the way down through the bottom of the diaphragm and then out through the mouth. Again, it sends the same signal to the part of the body that controls our, our survival nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system says everything's okay. Now, the final tip I will give you, you can do this before every meeting. This is the bonus tip. Pick the sound of music. This could be orchestral music with no words, or it could be words, it could be a, a rock band. It's completely up to you. Try and find some music that matches the energy and outcome of the meeting. And if you want to recharge your listening batteries, just play music for between three and five minutes before you go into a meeting. You'll, it will be like recharging your listening batteries. You'll go from red and yellow all the way through to green really quickly. So those rituals, pick them in that order and master them in that order. Notifications first, water second, breathing third. And then if you want to play music, they're the rituals I use. They're the rituals the Deep Listening Ambassador community use. And by the way, they are rituals of centuries-long religions, apart from switch off your notifications. Those, <laughs> those are, are, are relatively recent. All, all the other ones uh, are proven over multi-dominational religious thinking. They all have breathing, water, uh, some kind of music to bring people into a state for being able to reflect. So if you've mastered time and then you master these little techniques, we can then say, if you're in a band, if you're in an orchestra, whether you've played in the same location on the same day with the same music, with the same instrument, with the same conductor or the same band leader, every single musician tunes their instrument before they go into a performance mm. between three and five minutes. If the conversation matters, if you don't want to waste your time, 
tune yourself before you go into the conversation. Most people don't realize listening happens before, during, and after the conversation. You cannot generously listen during the conversation if you're not available. So those tips are to get you ready for the conversation. A lot of people say to me, how do I teach others to listen? Yeah. It's not your job. It's mm -hmm. not your job. Your job is to create a great container for listening. Your job is to be a great listening role model. It's not your job to teach. They will learn more from how you are being as a listener than whatever you teach them as a listener. Like kids, they'll watch what you do. They won't listen to what you say. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, David, which one of those three might you choose to pick up? You know, it's interesting because as you were going through them, one of the things that popped out to me especially was the bonus one about listening to music because I, I, I love music and I, I never really thought about that. It's almost like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost sounded like, and even listen to my language, sounded like um, it was, uh, it, it's like a cleansing of the palate, so to speak, in, in, your, in your listening. Um, by, by adding that music in, in between your, your listening sessions, um, it, it kind of cleanses your mind and helps you to just maybe like reset. Yeah, if we want to take and mix up metaphors even further, we could go, as you go into the conversation, all of us have these browser tabs open up, filling up a bit of our memory about what do I want to achieve? What happened in the last meeting? What's happening in the meeting after this? What's happening in the last meeting? What am I planning for the weekend? What the music does is just slowly shut down each of those browser tabs and give us some working memory, which is mm -hmm. where language processing takes place in the brain gives us working memory to be available because working memory is finite. A lot of people say, um, well, I'm an awesome multitasker. I can multitask and listen. No, you can't. You actually task switch very quickly, yet you pay a tax as you switch between each of those different contexts. So mm. you can multitask. You can listen to music and drive a car. Don't get me wrong. You can chop vegetables and watch a TV show. There, there is a whole group of routine, predictable tasks that you can undertake and you can multitask. Yet human dialogue in a workplace is not one of them. If you work in dynamic, competitive, collaborative, resource-constrained, competitive systems, you probably need to bring your full attention and not just pay attention, but give attention to the group or the person who's in front of you at any one time. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, I, I know in some of the um, information that I read uh, about you and, and some of the work that you've done, you've done a lot of interviewing of, of good listeners. And I, I'm kind of curious, when it comes to listening, what is something, if, if there's maybe one thing or a theme that runs across all of those people that are really good listeners, what what might that be? We, we sought to research and deeply dive into how the most diverse group of workplace listeners operate, whether that's an air traffic controller or a judge, whether that's a deaf interpreter, whether that's a foreign language interpreter, whether that's somebody who teaches dolphins how to speak and uh -huh. maneuver in a swimming pool, whether that's somebody who's a spy or if somebody's completely blind from birth, how do they listen? Hmm. And what we know, they have three things consistently in common. They're curious, they're flexible, hmm. and they're open to having their mind changed. Hmm. So they're, they're curious, they're open, they're flexible and they're very good at defining a process at the beginning of any conversation or context that they're in. They invest time to communicate about how to communicate. A simple mm -hmm. example of that, whether it's a group or a one-on-one -on -one conversation, what would make this a good conversation? Yeah. This very simple question signals back to the person, you're curious, you're open, 
And I'll show you how you'll be flexible with that shortly as well. Now, in asking that question, we don't ask them, what will make this a great conversation for you, David? Mm. We, we don't actually want to know what would make the, a good conversation for them. Here's why. If we're in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, there's always a third element in the conversation. And that third element in the conversation is the dialogue. That's the shared space between the speaker and the listener. Now, remember, we swap mm -hmm. positions regularly. Listener sure. becomes speaker, speaker becomes listener. And if you ask what would make this a great conversation for you, all you do is define success for them. But as humans, when we come together, when we generously listen to each other, we're actually seeking to progress or understand something in a way that makes us open. We want to notice how the dialogue is progressing rather than just how that person's position is progressing as well. Now, when you say what would make this a great conversation, you will then pick that up every 15 minutes in a 15 minute conversation and simply say, hey, David, at the beginning of this conversation, you said this will make this a good conversation. How are we going? Mm -hmm. So it's got nothing to do with what we talked about. We're talking about how we're talking about it. So world-class listeners do an awesome job on being in the conversation between the participants and going up and noticing the conversation as well. Mm. So they adopt two positions in it and above it. Mm. Now in group conversations, you can ask exactly the same question. And here's the dirty little secret of why we do that. We don't, do that so everybody gets to speak we do of course but we're training everybody to listen to everybody else right at the beginning of the meeting mm -hmm. we're getting everybody a chance to voice what will make this a good conversation and we've already warmed the group up because there's often people say to me oh oscar we have some fairly introverted people in our team how do i get them to speak up just set up a low risk way to do that as early as possible in the meeting and you've warmed them up mm. a good leader gets everybody to listen to them in a meeting a great leader gets everybody to generously listen to each other during the meeting and you can set that up as the host you can check in again every 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting these are the themes i heard if there's only two to three people in the room, you can be specific. But if it's five to six, you probably don't have time. You need to pick the themes out and then say, these are themes that we've heard. How are we going based on that? And then just be quiet. Now, what will happen is the people comfortable speaking up will. And then your role as the meeting host is to draw out those people who are sitting back and say, David, I'm curious to hear from you also. Yeah. Feel free to add on to that. Feel free to acknowledge anything else. Mm. Make it safe for them. Mm. Great listeners care first about the process before they get into the content. And your role as a leader is to be great at the process. And you can move into any content, in any context, in any problem, and liberate the group's thinking. So that's what over a hundred of the world's most diverse listeners have taught us. Mm. Wow. <clears throat> I, I really uh, appreciate that. And thank you so much for sharing that, Oscar. It, it reminds me of um, something that we'll often call, you, you're probably familiar with this term, but contracting. <clears throat> when we begin a, a workshop with a group, with a team, um, group coaching, we want to set up what are kind of the ground rules or what's going to make the conversation good. And I, I love that conversation or I love that question um, that would, you know, what would make this a great conversation and not just for you. I, that, that was really a, an interesting distinction so that everybody gets in, you know, involved. I, I, I really appreciate that. That's really good. Especially especially when it comes to getting those people who normally don't speak 
to get them involved because um, it's I, one of the things I found too in groups, um, teams, there's usually at least one or two of those people who are the ones who are really, they, they talk easily and they want to make sure that their voices are heard. And so as a, as a leader and as a facilitator of that meeting, we have to be willing and, and able and capable of, of making sure that all the voices are heard. Yeah, and your role is not to be the pilot of the conversation, yet be the air traffic controller of the conversation. Your job is to notice all the planes, which one's taken off, which one's in mid-flight, which one wants to land. Your role is to notice all the airspace. Now, one of the common myths is it's bad for people to speak out aloud and get their thinking out aloud. You just need to notice people's communication preferences. And if people need to speak out aloud to process their thinking, that's awesome. And there'll be a group of people who are synthesizing their speaking. They'll be sitting back and going, how do I distill this? How do I catalyze this? How do I bring it to its essence? Mm -hmm. And a skilled leader doesn't wait for those people to throw their thought hand grenade in at the back end of the meeting and completely derail the momentum of the meeting. They get those people talking as quickly as possible in the first third of the meeting. And we can simply ask them either to notice the following. David, you seem like you're in deep thought right now. I'm curious if you've noticed anything we're not discussing. So a good listener notices what people say, yet a great listener notices and facilitates what isn't said. Mm -hmm. Now, particularly in group context, this is multiplied exponentially if we're not deliberate in inviting those perspectives very regularly. And David might say, look, Oscar, the perspective we haven't even talked about is the customer. Oscar, the perspective we haven't even discussed is the competitive landscape. Oscar, the perspective we haven't discussed is we're in a heavily regulated environment and I'm not sure all of these would get through our regulatory requirements. Ah, the container's just been expanded, not by the person speaking, but by you as the leader facilitating listening for what's not said. So really simple thing for every leader to do is just keep a little diagram of the room, whether that's virtual or physical, close by on a scratch pad and just make a note who hasn't spoken. And if you bring those perspectives in, you're already building momentum towards the change. Because if people don't get to speak, they may either be obstacles, they may derail any kind of change initiatives you're trying to drive or increase performance. When people are heard, when people are seen, when people are valued by inviting their perspective, they're more likely to participate in bringing that change forward as well. Absolutely. I, 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 lo I love that. And, and I, I think that um, as I hear what you're saying and what you're sharing about listening, this is really, a lot about being a good leader as much it is as it is about being a good listener. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I, you're smiling because I think you, you probably have heard that before, but it just hit me just as you were speaking that that's really what this topic is all about is, is, is being a good listener means being a good leader. And being a listening leader will make meetings shorter, make your teams more productive, make projects land on time, means great employees stay longer than they may not if they are ignored. If you're in a commercial enterprise, you will collect a great group of profitable customers along the way. You'll have supplies who'll give you extra effort. And yet if you don't listen, if you just steamrolling outcomes, you're likely to notice a lot of rework in your system. 
where mm. people bring you a work product and you go, no, 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 it's not what I said. Mm. Well, it may have been what you said, but it's what they heard that matters. As a leader, it's not enough to notice how well, how articulate, what a great orator we are in communicating the vision of the future. What we need to do is pause once we've done that and notice what the team has heard because they may hear something very, very different. Remember, Tracy, Oscar, I need to see you immediately after this meeting. I heard I'm about to get fired. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Yet, because you took the time to check, I was able to recalibrate my discretionary effort going forward. Mm. As leaders, often we don't check to hear what the other person has heard. And as a result of that, we get rework, we get misworked, we get a work product that we didn't expect. So when it comes to your communication style, consider this. What process do you have in place to check what they've heard? Now, in formal systems, we can do surveys. You know, after a town hall, you can do a survey and ask people what they heard, what they're going to do with it. Yet, towards the end of any meeting, not at the end. So imagine we're in that 50-minute meeting, David. Ask this question at about the 35-minute mark or the 40-minute mark. And you can do this in any context. I'll give you a couple of examples. Hey, David, I'm just curious. If you were to summarize this conversation in a sentence, how would you do that? And all of a sudden you hear what they heard and you think, oh my goodness, that, that's, that's not my intention. Yet because you're asking that at the 35 minute mark, you've got some time remaining to adjust. If you're dealing with a peer, for example, in, in your organization, you may simply say, hey, David, if you were to summarize this conversation for your manager, how would you summarize that? Mm. So you don't want David to summarize it from their perspective. You want David to summarize it, how they would explain it to somebody else. And this will have the benefit of shortening how they say it, by the way. Now, often what they'll do is they'll go, hmm, that's a really good question. Let me think about that. And your job in that moment is to say absolutely nothing. Their, their, their mind will catch up, they will process, and they will give you a very insightful thing. Now, it's kind of like focusing your camera. It's a bit blurry at first, but eventually they'll focus and they'll, they'll get what they say. And then you've realized that, hey, you've done a great job in communicating what you want to do or you haven't and then you've got the balance of the meeting to do that uh, you can use the same technique if you face customers you can say hey if you had to summarize this conversation for the head of your finance department how would you summarize it if you're talking to a ceo how would you summarize this for the shareholders for the board and the other perspective you can always um, ask people to do is uh, Hey, David, if this was the subject line of an email, how would you summarize this conversation today? And they go, oh, okay. Because you're putting a container around it, most people know the subject line of an email is quite short. <laughs> and, and they'll tend to say it in one breath or one sentence. Hmm. Now, why are you doing this? You're doing this to hear what hasn't been said good leaders listen for what's said and great leaders notice what's not said. Mm. And when you know that people can think nine times faster than they can speak, we, sp we speak at about 125 to 150 words per minute, yeah, we can think it up to 900. If you just listen to what they say the first time, you're hearing 14% of their thinking. This is why we have confusion, chaos, conflict, rework, in workplaces because everybody thinks they're really good listeners paraphrasing what people say the very first time to be a generous listener hear what they say and notice what they haven't said hmm. now david i suspect you took some <laughs> notes as you were doing this and i did <laughs> particularly curious what notes you took because this yeah. is an example of using the same question that I just used in that example. So I'm curious, which which one of those really landed for you? 
Well, there's a couple of things. And, and one of which is that I noticed that as you are describing what good leaders do and good listeners do, the thing that jumped out at me is that they ask good questions and they're, they're willing to be able to ask questions about what someone heard. And I think that if, if, if you're an emerging leader listening to this right now, and if you're part of the emerging leader inner circle, you know that I talk about um, asking good questions. And I think that this is an example, a great example of how you can use it to become a, a more generous listener. So that was, that was the first thing is that I noticed that you, you, you demonstrated how to ask some really good questions. Um, the, the second thing that, um, that I noticed, and I'm looking at my notes here, um, it was really, you were, you were more curious in, about um, what that person heard and not so much about what you thought they heard. So that was, that, th those were kind of the two things I think that hit me really, uh, really strongly. Yeah. And note-taking is also from our listening research, we know that people who take notes during a conversation have high perceived comprehension, particularly if they play their notes back. Now, don't don't take verbatim notes. David hasn't written down everything I've said. He's just taken very specific notes and then come back into the context. So, so when it comes to listening, just take short notes and equally with questions. If your question is to further your understanding in a conversation, particularly in group discussions, it's unlikely to be a productive question. Mm. If your question is about the process and the outcome and that question we asked at the beginning, what will make this a good conversation? You're probably on the right track. The shorter the question, the better, by the way. If your question has got more than eight words, here's a really mm. simple heuristic to work by. Uh, it's more likely to elicit a more open response from somebody bias questions tend to be eight words or more. Now, beware of people peddling false binaries to you, bias questions versus open questions. Neither is correct or incorrect. The skill for you as an emerging leader is noticing when to use open questions and when to use bias questions. Bias questions are really critical for decision-making, resource allocation, when you want to bring the group to conclusion. Bias questions are really important. Given our time remaining, how would we like to focus it? So there's a bias question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As opposed to what would make this a good conversation? It's an open question. I ask the bias question towards the end of the meeting. I ask the open question towards the beginning of the meeting. At the beginning of a relationship or a project, I will tend to ask the open questions, which are the shorter questions, which are the collaborative questions, which are the build common understanding questions when i move towards the middle and the end of a meeting a relationship or a project as a leader we need to get the group to make decisions allocate finite resources and go towards an outcome most of us are not even conscious that our questions have weight have energy have direction if you want to read some amazing books on the topic of asking the right questions. Warren Berger has written mm. two books on asking great questions, and he's just about to write his third book. He's interviewed me on how to listen for great questions. Mm. And Warren Berger's work as a journalist, he was professionally asking lots of questions, but his two books and his third one about to come out is just spectacular in helping you have a range of questions not just the what, when, where, why, how. He asks the what if, the what else. All these kinds of questions that unleash potential. Hmm. As a leader, if you're asking questions, you're learning and so are they. If you're making statements or asking bias questions, you're 
probably shutting down alternatives and narrowing the possibilities. Now, as I said earlier on, neither is correct or incorrect. Just be conscious of when it's appropriate. It's really interesting, Oscar. I, I've never thought about the the bias questions narrowing the possibilities. And 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 I love too the fact that you said that it's not right or wrong. It's just, I guess, when you use them and being aware of when you're using them. And if you're using them at the appropriate time, great. Yeah. And a lot of people might be asking, oh, that's really good, Oscar, but how do I know when it's appropriate? The answer is in that listening compass you held at the beginning of the conversation, you asked them what would make this a good conversation. If your question serves that purpose, it's a productive question. Mm -hmm. If that question doesn't serve that purpose, it's probably not likely to be a productive conversation you are not controlling the conversation as a leader. The dialogue is. The dialogue, the agreed outcome when we all ask that question at the commencement of the conversation, what will make this a good conversation? If we don't ask that question, an agenda is fine, yet the agenda talks to the content, not the process. Mm -hmm. That is so good. That is so good. So one thing that you mentioned a little while ago, um, it, it sparked a question in my mind, and I'd love to come back to it for just a minute. And it really is around the idea of the cost of not listening. So in organizations, kind of going back and maybe even to, to my thinking um, uh, at the beginning of our conversation about just moving so fast and and the, and and not listening what 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 do organizations miss or what is the, the cost of that not listening to 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 organizations in organizations the outcome they're driving towards is is the gas pedal let's the accelerator listening is the steering wheel Listening helps you notice, is this the direction we want to be going in? Do we need to adjust course based on the speed and the current location and the amount of gas we have in our car? Yeah. Given we just took a wrong turn, how will listening help us get back on track? Hmm. Listening is the consciousness to notice not just what's happening for us as a team, but for our department for our organization, for our ecosystem, and for the community in which we operate in. When we don't listen, we're driving a car with just the gas pedal, no brake and no steering wheel. <laughs> so you can go really fast and be super productive. You just might crash. You just might be in the wrong direction. You just might run out of gas four miles out from your final destination. So mm -hmm. for many of us, we're, we're not conscious that listening helps us to adjust. It helps us stay on direction and it helps us look left, right, and make sure that we're taking into account everything around us in terms of traffic and things like that. But most practically in a commercial setting, the absence of listening contributes directly to reduce profitability, contributes directly to great staff who leave our organizations before we want them to, creates an environment where people don't want to give discretionary effort because they know they're not heard. And worst, worst, worst of all, you may be in a commercial organization where you're winning customer after customer after customer, yet you're winning the wrong ones because you're winning with what you heard, they thought you were going to solve for them. And what you have is a group of really unprofitable customers. And worse mm. than that, they're going to be your secret assassins in the mm. marketplace. They will tell other people, yeah, they want our business, but they don't get us. Yeah, they want our business, but they didn't deliver what we asked for. Yeah, they want our business, but what they said they were going to do in the movie trailer and what turned up during the movie nah i wouldn't recommend it to anybody yet the opposite is true 
when you listen to customers and you truly get them, they become your secret sales force. Mm. They will promote you in places you will never be able to promote yourself. Mm. You know, hey, if you want to work with David, he's got an amazing inner circle. Yet it's what happens inside the inner circle and the way he sets us up to listen and learn from each other. That's mm. the magic. Now, David, you have no idea that's going on. You're not undertaking any effort. And because you're showing up and role modeling, listening, they're showing you why David's different. They're telling their friends and you're having a bigger impact. Profit is just a measure. Mm. At the end of the day, as leaders, we want a legacy. And the legacy we want to leave is people enjoy working together in the direction that you set with them. Oscar, this has been just an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for um, just all of your wisdom on, on listening. I, I think that it's a topic that I know I have to continue to work at. And I know the leaders that are listening want to get better at. And I know that your your most recent book, I can see it on your bookshelf behind you, How to Listen, um, would be a really a good resource for, for them. Um, tell them how, how, how do they get a hold of that? Um, and I know you've written two other books as well. So maybe there might be some other uh, uh, resources for them that if they want to get a hold of them, how would they do that? Yeah, look, How to Listen is the most comprehensive book around listening in the workplace. We interviewed over 2,500 people that we knew and 2,500 people we didn't know for the book. Uh, we did deep dive interviews, as we mentioned, with over 100 of the world's most diverse listeners in there. there there's a research in the book at that time to data points for 14,000 workplace listeners across geographies, across professions, across genders across age groups, across educational backgrounds. So we, we have multiple ways to think about that. We also talk about how you listen across cultures, across complex systems and simple systems in one-on-one -on -one and group conversations as well as systemic conversations. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I think the <laughs> audio book, the audio book version of it is uh, the most compelling format for the book, but I'm biased because I'm a listening guy. But we yeah. also have extended interviews that didn't make it fully into the book in, in the audio book. So if you do cool. like to listen to the audio book, I definitely recommend that there. One thing, if you want to improve your listening, you can go to listeningquiz.com. You can take the seven minute quiz. Most people finish it in four minutes. It's only 20 questions about your listening there and we'll we'll generate a report for you which will tell you what your primary and secondary listening barriers are and then three specific tips based on your listening barriers about what to do about it so whether it's go and grab the book how to listen wherever you buy good books or visit listeningquiz.com and learn a little bit more about your listening they're the two resources i would recommend that make the biggest impact straight away for most people in the workplace Mm, I love that. Um, thank you so much. I, we will make sure that we link to that in the show notes. And um, where can people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you uh, online? Um, what's the best place to get, get in touch with you? Oh, look, I think it's super sexy that people want to get in touch with me. But honestly, I'd prefer you to get in touch with your own listening if you go to listeningquiz.com, the report has got all those kind of coordinates to how to get in touch with the Oscar, whether okay. that's through social media or email or carrier pigeon across the Pacific. <laughs> um, you just take the quiz and you'll find out all those things. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Oscar, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. appreciate your generosity of time. Also, the generosity uh, of your listening and, and just your sharing of, you know, your wisdom and the research that you've done as well. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Now, don't stop any recordings. Okay. <laughs> All right. It, 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 it. Ha, ha, have you got five minutes and we can do I, a little bit of both. We can do a little bit of bonus content absolutely. for your inner circle or yes. something like that. So, so. What's the one thing you'll do differently in your listening as a result of our conversation today? Oh gosh, that's a great con that's a great question. Um, I think really the the thing that I will do differently is start the conversation with a question 
what would make this a great conversation? I, I think that's a, that really stuck out to me as something that is really important. And I noticed too, that you asked me that before we started rolling. <laughs> so I love that. And when you were talking about that, you know, in our conversation, I thought, oh my goodness, that's great. I love it. <laughs> now, if you want to practice that, practice that first with somebody you trust, you have a strong relationship with, and then work your way out as you build your confidence up in that. Don't, yeah. don't try that in a, in a first time meeting with, with somebody that's a kind of high risk or at risk kind of conversation where something's consequential. Sure. So that if you're practicing that question, just practice with someone you know and trust and say, hey, I'm experimenting with this question. Um, I'd love to ask you this question. Oh, that's great. That's great. The that's second question is, uh, if we did this all over again, what would make it more productive for your audience? Oh, my goodness. That's, that's a great question. What would make it more productive for my audience? Um Boy, I don't know. Um, I think that I, I really enjoyed where it went. I really enjoyed uh, talking about the, you know, the cost of of not listening, um, some of the some of the common um, themes and common um, strategies of good listeners. I really, I really enjoyed. I enjoy, I enjoyed all of that. So I'm not sure that there would make it if we did it again. That anything would be more productive. I, I just think it was a great conversation. Okay. Um, I am more than happy to do a masterclass in your mastermind group, completely oh complimentary. Um, oh uh, it would need to be roughly this time of day. Sure, um, sure. So uh, if, yeah. if that worked, um, we, can, we can schedule that offline. Yeah. And um, please send me your postal address so I can send you a copy of the book. Well, and here's what I want to do too. So for those of you who will... Um, reach out to me and send me an email, david at davidmcglennon.com. And let me know what is one thing that you'll do differently from listening to this conversation and listening to what Oscar shared. Uh, you send that to me and I will make sure that for the first five people to do that, um, you'll have a uh, the, the audio book version of, uh, of Oscar's book, How to Listen. And uh, we'll make sure that we get that into your hands. Thank you for honoring me and listening. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for being on and, and the generosity of your time. Really appreciate it, Oscar.